Good morning. Welcome to the February 2021 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear three presentations and two items for your consideration. First, you will hear a presentation on the creation of an emergency broadband benefit program. Congress charged the FCC with developing a new $3.2 billion program, billion dollar program to help struggling Americans to pay for broadband internet service during the pandemic. Second, you will hear a presentation on the next steps for the agency's COVID-19 telehealth program. Congress recently provided an additional $249.95 million to support the FCC's efforts to expand connected care throughout the country and help more patients receive health care safely. Third, you will hear a presentation on the work the agency is doing to collect precise and accurate fixed and mobile broadband deployment data as part of its mission to close the digital divide. Fourth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would implement Section 902 of the Don't Break Up the T-Band Act of 2020, which requires the Commission to take action to help address the diversion of 911 fees by states and other jurisdictions for purposes unrelated to 911. Fifth, you will consider a third further notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to modify FCC rules consistent with changes that were made to the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act and the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021. This is your agenda for today. The first presentation is on the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, please proceed. Thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today, the Wireline Competition Bureau will give an update on the status of the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, a new program established by the Consolidated Appropriations Act to provide much needed support for broadband service and devices to low-income households during the COVID-19 pandemic. Eric Wu, attorney advisor in the Telecommunications Access Policy Division will give the presentation. Eric. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, good morning. I am Eric Wu, an attorney advisor in the Telecommunications Access Policy Division in the Wireline Competition Bureau. Uh, this presentation on the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program will cover the Emergency Broadband Benefit provisions of the Act, the FCC's current work to implement the Act, and next steps. On December 27, 2020, the Consolidated Appropriations Act became law. The Act, among other changes and actions intended to provide relief during the COVID-19 pandemic, established the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program to support broadband service and equipment for low-income households. The Act establishes a $3.2 billion Emergency Broadband Connectivity Fund in the Treasury of the United States and directs the FCC to use that fund to create the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. The FCC may use up to 2% of the fund for administrative expenses. And the Act provides that the fund will last for six months after the date the Secretary of Health and Human Services determines that a public health emergency as a result of COVID-19 no longer exists or when the fund is depleted, whichever is earlier. Broadband providers must elect to participate in the EBBP. Uh, Eligible telecommunications carriers that currently participate in the Lifeline program may participate in EBBP without further approval. Other broadband providers that have a low income or COVID-19 program as of April 1st, 2020 may receive automatic approval from the FCC to participate in EBBP. All other broadband providers may seek expedited approval from the FCC to participate in EBBP. 
Uh, the EBPP benefit will provide a discount of up to $50 per month on broadband service and associated equipment provided to low-income households. On tribal lands, the discount increases to up to $75 per month. Uh, participating providers will receive the reimbursement for providing discounts on service to eligible low-income households. The broadband plans offered by participating providers must have been offered as of December 1st, 2020. Uh, the EBBP will also support a one-time discount of up to $100 off the price of a laptop, desktop computer, or tablet purchased from the participating provider. The household receiving the discount must pay between $10 and $50 toward the price of the device. And the participating provider will receive the reimbursement for providing the discount on a connected device to eligible low-income households. Participating providers must submit certain certifications to the FCC in order to receive reimbursement. And the FCC is required to adopt audit requirements to ensure provider compliance and prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. A household may qualify for the EBBP benefit if at least one member of the household meets the qualifications for a lifeline, which are if the household income is at or below 135% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of that size, at least one member of the household participates in Medicaid, SNAP, Supplemental Security Income, Federal Public Housing Assistance, or Veterans and Survivors Pension Benefit, or for households on tribal lands, uh, participation in uh, certain tribal benefit programs. The Act has also expanded eligibility beyond those eligible for the Lifeline program. If a member of a household has applied for and have been approved to receive benefits from the Federal Free and Reduced Price Lunch Program or School Breakfast Program, uh, has experienced a substantial loss of income since February 29, 2020, has received a federal Pell Grant in the current award year, or meets the eligibility criteria for participating providers' existing low income or COVID-19 program. Uh, households can verify their eligibility for the program through a variety of mechanisms set forth in the law. The FCC will be using the Universal Service Administrative Company, USAC, to administer to the EBBP as allowed under the Act. USAC operates the Lifeline National Verifier and National Lifeline Accountability, Accountability Database, which the FCC will leverage for eligibility verifications and reimbursement processing. The Act also permits the FCC to apply existing Lifeline program rules to the EBBP. For example, the FCC can apply the Lifeline definitions of household or tribal lands to the EBBP. Uh, for the timeline, uh, the FCC sought comment on the EBBP in a January 4th, 2021 public notice. Comments were due on January 25th and 138 parties filed in the proceedings. Uh, the FCC recently hosted a roundtable on February 12th with two panel discussions, one on consumer outreach and enrollment, and the second focusing on broadband provider participation and consumer choice. Reply comments were due yesterday, February 16th, and the Act requires the FCC to promulgate rules within 60 days of enactment of the Act. The FCC and USAC are currently working on developing the order to establish the program rules, standing up program systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Uh, in the interest of speed, we are going to reserve comments from the bench until the end of the three presentations. So Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, the second presentation today is on the COVID-19 telehealth program and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Once again, Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, please proceed with introducing item number two on today's agenda. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Next, the Wireline Competition Bureau will give an update on the status of the COVID-19 telehealth program. Congress in the Consolidated Appropriations Act provided a second round of funding for the commission program that helps healthcare providers purchase broadband service and telehealth equipment to help safely treat patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. Stephanie Minnick, an Assistant Division Chief in the Wireline Competition Bureau's Telecommunications Access Policy Division will give the presentation. Stephanie. Thank you for the introduction, Chris. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. 
I'm pleased to provide you with this update on the COVID-19 telehealth program, which uses congressionally appropriated funding to help healthcare providers provide connected care services to patients at their homes or at mobile locations in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Last March, as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, Congress appropriated $200 million to the FCC to support the efforts of healthcare providers to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The CARES Act specified that this funding was to be used for providing telecommunication services, information services, and devices necessary to enable the provision of telehealth services. The CARES Act was signed into law on March 27, 2020. The FCC established the COVID-19 telehealth program on April 2nd. The application filing window opened on April 13th, 2020. By July 8th, the Wireline Competition Bureau had approved 539 applications and awarded the full $200 million in funding commitments. After receiving these funding commitments, funding awardees purchased connected devices and ordered eligible services. Funding awardees had until December of 31st, 2020 to purchase connected devices or to begin to implement eligible services. After purchasing services and or connected devices, funding awardees submit requests for reimbursement and associated invoice documentation which are reviewed by FCC staff before CARES Act funding is dispersed from the U.S. Department of the Treasury. CARES Act funding awardees have until July 31st of this year to file their request for reimbursement and should submit post-program feedback reports by January 31st, 2022. As of yesterday, February 16th, over 84% of CARES Act funding awardees have filed invoice submissions, and over 70% of CARES Act funding has been dispersed. Last December, as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021, Congress appropriated an additional $249.95 million to the FCC's COVID-19 telehealth program. Among other things, the act directed the FCC within 10 days of the act's enactment to issue a public notice seeking comment on the metrics used to evaluate applications for the second round of funding and how to treat applications filed but unfunded from the initial round. As required by the act, the Bureau released a public notice on January 6, 2021 that set a comment filing deadline of January 19th. Over 80 comments were filed by a variety of stakeholders, which included healthcare providers, telehealth product vendors, and trade associations. After reviewing, reviewing these comments on February 2nd, the FCC adopted a report and order finding that it is in the public interest to use the Universal Service Administrative Company to administer the COVID-19 telehealth program going forward. Regarding next steps, Commission staff will be teeing up for the Commission's consideration, a report and order that, if adopted, would establish application evaluation criteria for round two and provide additional information about the round two application process. Thank you, Ms. Minnick. Uh, Madam Secretary, will you now announce the next presentation? Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, Item three on your agenda is a presentation on collection of broadband deployment data given by the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Wireline Competition, and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Jane, Jean Cadu, Chair of the Broadband Data Task Force, will introduce the presentation. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And before we hear this presentation, I want to announce today that I have directed staff to launch a new broadband data task force with Ms. Cadu at the helm. Jean is a no stranger to guiding big efforts at the FCC and our mapping and deployment responsibilities call out the need for a new task force to help us chart the way forward. So Ms. Cadu, please proceed. 
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Good morning. I'm deeply honored by the appointment to head the new broadband ta data task force. The need for accurate data, pinpointing where broadband is service is available, and perhaps more importantly for our FCC purposes, where it is not available, has never been greater. Families and businesses across the country are struggling to adapt to the reality of remote schooling, telework, and the shift to online operations and services. But for many, those realities are made more challenging, if not impossible, by the lack of fast and reliable broadband service. Commission efforts to remedy that digital divide have long been hampered by the lack of precise, granular data on the availability and quality of fixed and mobile broadband services, data that would enable us to target resources to the areas most in need. I am excited to be part of the effort to develop and implement, finally, the data collections, systems, and processes to give us, as well as industry, our state and local and tribal partners, and consumers, the tools to accurately and precisely determine broadband availability so that we may focus our efforts to close the digital divide. I want to assure the chairwoman and commissioners that a large team of experts from offices and bureaus across the entire commission are already hard at work and that the many difficult and interdisciplinary tasks we need to complete are already well underway. Kirk Bergee, the chief of staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau and one of the leaders of the joint effort is here to give you a brief overview of the ongoing work being done by the dedicated staff in the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Wireline Communications uh, Competition Bureau, sorry, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the International Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, and the Office of Managing Director. So truly, I was not lying when I said the entire commission. And Kirk will also outline for you what we intend to accomplish and our next steps. So thank you very much. And Kirk, over to you. Thank you, Jean. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Commission has long recognized that precise granular data on the availability and quality of fixed and mobile broadband are vital to bringing digital opportunity to all Americans, no matter where they live. To meet the need for such data, in August of 2019, the Commission adopted a new data collection distinct from the FCC Form 477 that would collect geographically precise and detailed data on broadband availability and include essential features such as technology and download and upload speeds, which would be subject to challenge by input from the public and other stakeholders. In March of last year, Congress passed the Broadband Data Act, which established specific requirements for the Commission's collection of broadband availability data including a location level collection for fixed broadband and the use of standardized propagation model parameters for mobile and fixed wireless broadband. In addition, the Broadband Data Act codified the role of stakeholder input, calling for the use of challenges, crowdsourcing, and verified data from state, local, and tribal governmental entities, third parties, and other federal agencies in assessing the accuracy of provider data. The Broadband Data Act also required the creation of the Broadband Serviceable Location Fabric, a comprehensive database of all locations in the country to which fixed broadband could be made available. The Commission's second report and order and third further notice adopted in July of 2020 implemented Broadband Data Act requirements and further developed the framework and elements of the new data collection. In the second report and order, the Commission adopted specific technical reporting requirements, including the use of geographically specific polygons and address and location lists for fixed services and propagation maps and models for mobile and terrestrial fixed services. The second report and order also adopted the broadband serviceable location fabric, along with processes for verifying provider data, such as the use of the high cost universal broadband or hub database, regular audits, and the acceptance of crowdsource information about the accuracy of provider data. The commission's third report and order adopted last month implemented further refinements along with challenge processes that will help ensure that the data collection will yield a robust and reliable data resource for the commission, Congress, federal and state policymakers and consumers. The commission delegated certain technical and other determinations to the bureaus and offices in the third report and order. And with the appropriation of $98 million in funding by Congress at the end of last year, we are moving forward quickly to implement the new data collection and mapping platforms. The new data collection will collect provider deployment data as well as verification and challenge data, which will allow the commission to gather data of an unprecedented scope and volume 
from a broad range of stakeholders, including internet service providers, the public, state, local, and tribal governments, other federal agencies, and third parties, such as companies specializing in broadband mapping and data collection. But the commission will not only collect more data, it will collect better data. The new technical standards and data specifications established by Congress and implemented by the commission, such as minimum service speeds and standardized input parameters for mobile service and maximum buffer size for fixed service, together with new categories of data collected, including the fabric and infrastructure and drive test data collected from service providers, will promote a high level of accuracy in the broadband data ultimately produced by the commission. The commission will also use an array of data quality processes to refine and improve the data over time. These processes will include data, data validation at intake, technical assistance to stakeholders, user-friendly challenging crowdsourcing, audits, and where necessary, rigorous verification and enforcement actions. With these new data tools, the Commission will produce vastly more granular and accurate broadband deployment maps, which in turn will allow the Commission to target universal service funding more precisely and produce better data for Commission reports and analyses. Implementing the data collection will give the Commission a number of resources to use in its broadband mapping efforts. The new geographically specific reporting standards will enable the Commission to produce comprehensive, publicly available broadband maps that depict fixed broadband sorry, fixed broadband availability data down to the individual location level and show mobile broadband propagation maps standardized across all mobile providers. The challenge and crowdsourcing processes will enable consumers, tribal and, gov and governmental entities and other interested stakeholders to submit real world information based on actual experiences in the field that sharpens provider data and informs commission analyses and investigations. Commission audits and, if appropriate, enforcement proceedings will be additional tools that will enhance the accuracy of the maps and data the Commission produces. In our next steps to implement the Broadband Data Act, we will seek comment and adopt an order on various technical requirements that will fine-tune the collection and challenge processes. We will carry out procurements necessary for the data collection and verification systems, the public-facing maps, and the broadband serviceable location fabric, followed by development and implementation of these platforms. We will also explore other avenues for working with stakeholders to verify data. As our work proceeds, we will release a public notice to provide at least six months advance notice of the first filing deadline for the collection. We will also begin the process of conducting outreach to tribes, filers, and other stakeholders to facilitate compliance with and participation in broadband deployment reporting and the challenge processes. There's obviously a lot of work ahead, but we look forward to realizing the extraordinary impact that having precise and accurate broadband deployment data will have on the Commission's efforts to close the digital divide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berge. We will now hear comments from the bench, uh, beginning with Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, uh, congratulations to uh, the acting chair um, on holding the gavel for the first meeting. Uh, I'll start uh, at the top where we started with the broadband, broadband benefit program. Uh, to me, I would venture to say that this isn't just the top priority for any individual commissioner. Uh, I would go so far as to suggest that this is the top priority for the entire commission. And we look at the task ahead of us uh, of implementing within a matter of days, potentially from now, uh, the structure for this $3.2 billion effort. Uh, I think that sort of signifies that this is really an, an all hands on deck effort. As we move forward, I've talked about two main priorities that I have for this program, uh, both of which I think are codified and embedded in the statute that Congress passed. Uh, the first of which is prioritizing remote learning. If we look at the eligibility requirements that Congress put in the statute, whether it's the free or reduced lunch program, uh, the school breakfast eligibility uh, vehicle or Pell Grants, I think it's very clear that Congress had in mind the FCC using this funds to address remote learning uh, and to help out um, school kids uh, and, and the, the parents of the school kids uh, during this pandemic. In fact, if you look at the public notice that we issued um, announcing the comment cycle for this, we concluded there that the Emergency Broadband Benefit <coughs> Program is in part designed to ensure that the program beneficiaries are able to meaningfully access and participate in remote learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and if you step back from that and you look at you know, some of the cost estimates associated with uh, making very real progress uh, on closing the remote learning gap, the 3.2 billion that have been appropriated here by Congress would go 
uh, a really long way in addressing that challenge. So I look forward to uh, working with my colleagues and finding ways that we can advance uh, that prioritization uh, of school kids remote learning through this program. Second, I've talked about ensuring that we have truly robust participation in this program. Uh, Congress was clear that they wanted a range of different providers, uh, whether ETC or non-ETC, a range of different technologies to be available to American families that will maximize their choice. It will ensure that we have competition. It'll ensure that uh, we reach the most Americans as possible with this funding. So I think uh, we should continue to do whatever we can, whether it's uh, backend website work or database work right now to make sure that when we're ready to go, that we give uh, a range of providers sort of an equal and fair shot uh, to participate uh, in this proceeding. Um, Next, I want to turn to the, the telehealth uh, presentation and really express my uh, thanks and, and gratitude for the telehealth team for everything that they've been doing. If you go back a little over two years ago, that's when we sort of first identified this new trend in healthcare, the idea that you no longer have to go physically to a brick and mortar uh, healthcare facility to receive care. When you have internet connection uh, and a connected device, whether it's your iPhone or um, a specific healthcare device itself that's connected, you can now receive high quality care anywhere outside the confines of a, of a healthcare facility. I've said uh, a lot, probably too frequently at this point, that it's really the, the healthcare equivalent of shifting from blockbuster video to Netflix. Um, and so I think the work that we've done to help reorient our telehealth programs have been very successful. The COVID-19 telehealth program that we stood up in the wake of the CARES Act built off of the legwork that the team had been doing around this connected care concept. Um, and it's made it's made a difference, it's been a success. I've, I've personally had the chance to meet with at least eight different healthcare providers across six different states uh, that have benefited from the FCC's round one of the telehealth funding. And every single one of the doctors and healthcare providers there said that, um, the key to them being able to ramp up and deal with the spike in telehealth post COVID was the support that they were provided from the FCC's round one funding. Um, I, I've been in places like Perrysburg, Ohio at a mental health clinic that saw their uh, virtual visits spike 20 fold in the immediate wake of COVID. I've been in central Pennsylvania where uh, a healthcare provider told me that they sell their telehealth visits jumped 700 percent with COVID and they were able to meet that demand by buying additional services uh, and, and ensuring they had a robust ability to provide telehealth because of the FCC's round one funding. So the same thing in Michigan, University of Michigan Hospital went from about 400 uh, virtual visits per month to over 30,000. Um, again, when you sort of hear directly from these providers and see the difference it makes, it you know, brings home to me again, the gratitude and appreciation that I have for the FCC's team uh, that did amazing work on a quick turn to get that round one funding out. And I'm confident that we are gonna see results just like that with our round two funding. Uh, so thanks to everyone for the, the presentation on that. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, finally, on the, the mapping presentation, I think we still have uh, Gene, Kirk and, and, and Chris and the team. Thank you all for, for working on it. One quick question I had for the uh, the team on the presentation there is you walk through some of the steps, obviously, that we have to take uh, to get from where we are to where we need to go. The funding that Congress provided in December being a key feature of that. Do you have an estimate of the timeline of those uh, steps or the, the timeline roughly uh, to where we get those uh, final maps that we're all aiming for? That's a hard question, Commissioner Carr. Uh, uh, we are working very hard and very fast on getting our contracting out. Um, as you know, that's sometimes a, a difficult process, um, but we're working very quickly on that and uh, are hoping to implement. We then, of course, have to develop a lot of very complex IT platforms. So it's hard to give you a, a, a real good estimate of, of precisely when we will have the mapping data, uh, but, but we're working on it as quickly as we can. Thanks, I think it's fair. In terms of roughly though, is it, do we think it's six months, one year, 18 months? Is there a landing zone that we're, that we're targeting? Obviously, because a lot of this goes ultimately to um, making progress on, you know, RDOF phase two and 5G fund and sort of all that additional progress we have left on closing to divide is gonna potentially uh, hinge off of, uh, you know, a quick turn on these, this mapping work. 
Uh, again, really good question. Um, we're we're really again the, with the funding just out. We're still really working with potential contractors and getting RFPs out. So we'll know a little bit better in a in a very short time uh, once we hear what those contractors can do. Um, I, I think based on my experience with with other developing other complex systems at at, at the commission and 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 how difficult it is to do these kind of very difficult data. Uh, gatherings, um, uh, it's it's going to take a while. So I think it's we're talking probably next year. But I, I, that is a guess. I don't hold me to it in terms of whether we'll try everything to get it quicker. Uh, well, thank you so much, and kudos to to the uh, ac uh, acting chairwoman on, on putting you and your team in charge of this. Obviously, I have you know tremendous respect for everything that you've done. It seems like you know, wherever Gene goes, you can identify some of the hardest and toughest projects at the FCC, and you've left a, a wake of. Uh, really uh, impressive successes. So uh, congratulations to you and, and, and thank you uh, really to the chairwoman for putting a, a good team together on this. And uh, and that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Uh, now, Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm going to go in reverse order here. Uh, and, and again, thank you for the presentation on mapping and for that detailed update on the commission's efforts, you know, to update our broadband data and maps, this hard work uh, and really the focus combined with, you know, the mapping funding that Congress, as you mentioned, appropriated last year uh, is going to propel the commission towards significantly better data practices, you know, for, for too long. The commission, you know, was aware that our broadband data was deeply flawed. Uh, and, and, you know, was pushing forward with data practices. Uh, and, and we shouldn't be surprised in some ways that parties are already raising some uh, instances where mapping related problems are arising in RDOF in the phase one results. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm focused here as well. And going forward, the commission uh, does need to ensure solid data foundations on our high cost programs. And, and as Commissioner Carr just mentioned, this is also going to very much uh, drive results in the 5G Mobility Fund RDOF phase two. And so now is that time for thoughtful execution. I do look forward uh, to working with you and, and with the, the, the cross collaboration of the commission's talented staff and the many stakeholders we have uh, on these processes to make better broadband maps a reality. Moving to, to, to telemedicine, you know, I have uh, a long um, uh, thought and, and seen that the future of medicine uh, is, is with telehealth and with telemedicine. As, as folks that, that know a little bit of my narrative here, I have a father who practices uh, in, in Kansas and Missouri, I have an older brother who practices medicine in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and, and a brother who practices in Virginia. And so even before the pandemic, each of them in their own way told me about what the future of medicine looked like and what telehealth and telemedicine was going to do. And obviously that has been like so many things um, uh, amplified and, uh, and pushed forward in a tremendous fashion through the pandemic. Uh, and so in order to keep patients and our frontline medical workers healthy, telemedicine is a critical piece. You know, the one thing that I'll be looking for here, obviously, is that we make sure uh, that we are learning from our prior connected care efforts uh, and making sure that we are driving impact in a more efficient and effective manner here uh, because a lot is at stake. And so to close with the uh, EBB, which is critically important to me, you know, one thing that you even do, just taking a step back and thinking about telemedicine and mapping, and of course the emergency broadband benefit, I am, um, it, it, is, it dawns on me that each of these, first of all, are congressionally mandated. Uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to move quickly and in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, these are congressional mandates. And so uh, they should be something that we're able to move with uh, with deliberate speed on as we are tasked with. The second thing that really comes to my mind is that the interconnectedness, like so many of the things that we handle here on the commission, uh, mapping, telemedicine, and of course, broadband for all, are all have a interconnectedness here. Uh, and so, you know, I also take note, as I've long stressed, that even now in 2021, uh, communities of color, Black Americans, Latinx Americans, uh, are still by a wide, wide margin significantly less likely to have that home broadband connection that we know they need than their counterparts. 
And now more than ever, this cannot stand. And so I have great expectations for this program. And if we're successful, as we must be, the emergency broadband benefit will reach more disconnected and low-income people, more households of color, than any prior FCC effort to close the digital divide. And so I look forward uh, to working with my fellow commissioners all, uh, with the Bureau and the great work that they've already done, and of course the collaborative partners across the spectrum here that we will need to partner with us to execute this necessary but hard work. That's federal and state, local governments, broadband providers, nonprofits, philanthropists, educators, and many more. So uh, look forward to that work and being able to um, uh, let folks know that help is on the way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for the fantastic presentations today, and I would like to um, I would like to acknowledge the um, the immense amount of work behind the scenes that is taking place by the acting chairwoman um, in order to get all of uh, all of these major initiatives coordinated, staffed, and, and underway and managed in at um, a very sophisticated level of detail in a very short time. So. Um, so kudos, uh, kudos uh, to to all on that uh, on that basis. Um, I'd like to begin by addressing the first presentation. Uh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Carr has already stressed the importance of remote learning in uh, EBB. So I'm not going to belabor the point. I think he he said everything that uh, that needs saying on there. Um, I would like to uh, I would like to emphasize that in my communications with carriers who are looking to participate in the EBB program. Um, carriers have repeatedly stressed the um, uh, importance of being able to deliver service in a way that's freed from bureaucratic obstacles. Be um, very often, the uh, carriers that are in a position best to do so for those uh, most in need are the ones that have the least uh, back-end compliance machinery and in, in some cases are ones that don't have prior participation in the USF programs. So I know the commission is working hard in order to cut that red tape and find ways to rapidly onboard um, uh, onboard participants in EBB who don't have prior USF participation. Um, I applaud the commission's efforts to um, to uh, to make this uh, to make this functional. Just to to give one example from uh, from my personal experience, uh, I spoke to a small cable carrier in uh, located in rural Missouri uh, who indicated that four out of the five counties that she served were were classified as. Um, as in, in serious need, but also indicated that um, that as the primary provider in that area, nonetheless, uh, she didn't have an easy way to interface with the FCC systems. I'm aware that we've taken steps to resolve issues like that, and that's precisely why I applaud the flexibility of, um, of all of the USAC and FCC people who are working to deliver this, um, this challenging congressional mandate in, on a short time frame, and uh, I wanted, just wanted to indicate my appreciation for that. Um, second, uh, regarding the second presentation, um, I think that there's been a lot of great discussion about how um, internet connectivity plus a device are required for care and how this has the possibility to make uh, a real difference in the daily lives of, um, of average Americans throughout the country um, as a way to receive essential services that uh, are in critical need. Um, I also wanted to I also wanted to point out uh, the acting chairwoman's valuable efforts at addressing um, other another aspect of telemedicine, which is uh, which is providing the remote delivery of specialized services, whether the area is geographically remote or not. Um, I had the privilege of attending um, uh, of attending a presentation at a DC area hospital um, that uh, that she set up, where we had the opportunity to review some of these initiatives in practice. And uh, clearly, there's a lot of exciting opportunities there uh, for us to continue um, with the work of telemedicine down the road. Uh, finally, regarding the third presentation, um, I want to applaud the Commission's efforts in, um, in getting to the point of, of superior mapping. Obviously, this is, uh, this is an area that was not always uh, exclusively tasked to the Commission. And so there's been an aspect of transition here where the uh, various federal entities involved with broadband data mapping have, um, have had to consolidate their information with us. And the other side of it is we've had to develop um, new facilities and new expertise in order to assess that, uh, that data. Um, it's, uh, it seems to me beyond question 
that the far more granular, far more detailed, and far more audited and validated maps that will come out of this will enable us uh, to be much more effective and um, also to reduce waste, fraud, and abuse in closing the digital divide. So I wanted to applaud that effort as well and, and point to this as being something that has been uh, repeatedly raised by uh, members of Congress. So I'm glad to say that very soon after the necessary funding was available, we have already made significant progress down that road. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, commissioners. I, uh, I too have some remarks and I guess I will begin with what is most obvious. This is my first meeting serving as acting chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commission. I thank the president for the opportunity to lead this agency and its uncommonly talented staff. It is a privilege and an important responsibility because we have work to do to expand the reach of communications so that the benefits of the digital age reach everyone everywhere in this country. And that work begins today with the priorities for this agency laid out last year in legislation known as the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021. In it, Congress directed the FCC to establish a new emergency broadband benefit, expand its COVID-19 telehealth initiatives, and get going on a project to map where broadband is and is not all across the country. These are three big tasks. First, we are working our way out of a pandemic that has upended life across this country. As a nation, we have been asked to move so much of our day-to-day -day activity online, work, education, healthcare, and more. It's more apparent than ever that broadband is no longer nice to have, it's need to have for everyone, everywhere. And to make this happen, Congress directed this agency to establish a new emergency broadband benefit program. It will expand access to high-speed connections and offer a new way to connect for those struggling in this pandemic and the ongoing economic crisis. Now, specifically, Congress provided $3.2 billion for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which will provide discounts of up to $50 a month for internet service and up to $75 a month on tribal lands. It also will provide eligible consumers an opportunity to receive a discount on a computer or tablet. I believe in the urgency of now. We are stronger when we are all connected and this program is a powerful way to help make it happen. According to the Pew Research Center, one third of broadband users report they fear not being able to afford service during this pandemic. We need a program that responds to these concerns and is open to every eligible household. With so much of modern life now dependent on internet access, no one should have to choose between paying a broadband bill and paying rent or putting food on the table. Congress has recognized this urgency and required us to act with speed, providing us 60 days to write rules for this program. We must act decisively and we'll need to make hard choices along the way. Now, in order to meet this mark, this program must be exclusive, expansive, inclusive and transparent. I wanna thank all of the stakeholders who have been so active in this proceeding, who have shared their good ideas and advice. And I especially appreciate those generous participants in last week's round table, where we discussed the importance of outreach, awareness, competition, and consumer choice. We need to make the most of this shared interest and all reach out to local organizations, national organizations, schools, faith-based institutions, and others with the desire to help. So right here, right now, let me invite each of my colleagues to advance our outreach efforts and provide their ideas for partnership organizations. Together, I know we can make this program a success. Second, during the last year, our nation's healthcare providers, the hospitals, the clinics, and the heroic staff who run those institutions have been on the front lines battling this cruel pandemic. They deserve our gratitude, our prayers, and every possible tool we can provide them to make their efforts a success. For this reason, my first outings as acting chairwoman were visits to healthcare providers using telemedicine to extend the reach of their care to more patients in more places. Commissioner Carr and I spent time at Whitman Walker Health, a clinic with a storied history of providing health and wellness services, especially for the LGBTQ community. We learned how they are expanding access to care using new technologies, but also learned how old models of reimbursement and state-by-state -state licensing
can hold telemedicine back. Next, Commissioner Starks and I held a meeting with staff from the University of Virginia Center for Telehealth, led by Dr. Karen Ruban, who was an early evangelist on the power of telemedicine and is one of its foremost practitioners today. Moreover, she works where she works is the beneficiary of a recent grant from our Connected Care pilot program, and her team was eager to show us how telehealth can make a meaningful difference for rural Virginians, including those suffering from strokes and those seeking access to maternal care. And then at Children's National Hospital in Washington, Commissioner Symington and I witnessed state-of-the-art digital healthcare technology supported by the FCC that has improved provider-to-patient pediatric care across the region. But more than that, we were able to peer into the future of telehealth with practitioners describing how connectivity combined with data analytics would in time morph into new opportunities for care. So every visit was eye-opening, every discussion was exciting, but more exciting still is that following last year's $200 million grant program to boost telemedicine during the pandemic, Congress has provided the FCC with an additional $250 million to further extend its reach. That means we can do more good by expanding access to these technologies to assist with healthcare during this crisis and beyond. Now, third and finally, we have mapping. It's no secret that the FCC's existing broadband maps leave a lot to be desired. We can do better, and we will. Because now Congress has not only passed the Broadband Data Act directing the agency to update its data collection practices for its maps, it has provided us with funding to carry out this task. This is good news. It's the first step towards better broadband policy by providing us with the information we need to reach everyone everywhere in this country with high speed service, 100%. This is going to require an all hands effort at the agency with expertise from multiple bureaus and offices. It is going to require not just data from carriers, but input from consumers and state, local and tribal governments who know what's happening on the ground where they live. Now to get this done, I've decided we need to use exactly the same structure we used in another big effort at the agency the first of its kind wireless incentive auction and a task force. So as you heard today, I have announced that I have appointed Jean Cadu, who worked on that last very successful effort to lead the broadband data task force. She has a history of pulling off complicated projects and making it look easy. I know she'll do a great job and I'll make sure this agency provides her with every resource to do so. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Madam Chairwoman Commissioners, next on your agenda is an item for your consideration entitled 911 Fee Diversion, New and Emerging Technologies 911 Improvement Act of 2008. The item will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Each year, people place over 200 million emergency calls to 911 call centers in the United States. Funding for the 911 system is provided in large part through dedicated 911 fees that are established by each state and territory and appear as charges on customer bills for wireless, wireline, and other communication services. Despite the critical importance of 911, the Commission's annual reports to Congress on 911 fees show that some states use a portion of the fees collected for 911 for other purposes. This diversion of 911 fees puts lives at risk by depriving 911 call centers of the funding they need to function effectively and to modernize. Last December, Congress enacted legislation to address this problem. The legislation includes a provision directing the commission to issue final rules within 180 days, defining the purposes and functions for which the obligation or expenditure of 911 fees is acceptable. The notice of proposed rulemaking we present today seeks comment on proposed rules to implement this directive. 
With me today from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is Brenda Boykin, an attorney advisor in the Policy and Licensing Division. I would also like to thank David Firth, Erica Olson, Michael Wilhelm, John Evanoff, Jill Coogan, and Rachel Ware for their work on this item, as well as the other bureaus and offices that contributed. Now to Ms. Boykin. Thank you, Chief Folks. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. On December 27, 2020, the President signed the Don't Break Up the T-Band Act of 2020 as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021. Section 902 of the new legislation requires the Commission to issue final rules within 180 days or by June 25, 2021 defining what uses of 911 fees constitute 911 fee diversion. The draft notice of proposed rulemaking proposes and seeks comment on rules that would define the types of 911 expenditures by states and taxing jurisdictions that are acceptable under the criteria set forth in the new legislation. The notice also proposes to establish procedures that would allow states and taxing jurisdictions to petition the Commission for a determination that an expenditure of 911 fees not previously designated as acceptable in the rules could be treated as acceptable. In addition, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking proposes a rule that would prohibit any state or jurisdiction identified as a fee diverter in the Commission's annual report to Congress from serving on any advisory committee established by the Commission. Finally, the notice seeks comment on a requirement that a state or jurisdiction receiving a 911 grant under the NTIA Organization Act must provide information requested by the Commission to prepare its annual 911 fee report to Congress. The Bureau recommends adoption of this notice of proposed rulemaking and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boykin. Now we will hear comments from the bench and we'll begin with Commissioner Carr. Now, thank you so much. I want to start obviously by recognizing um, our colleague, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, for his work on this issue. Uh, this was one of his top priorities uh, at his time on the commission. It's great to see the progress that's been made, both with the NOI uh, last October and now with this NPRM, with the additional backing uh, of the legislative support from Congress. So the item has uh, my support and not to get too far ahead of the votes, but you know, the first item of an open meeting, uh, a bipartisan, hopefully 4-0, uh, <laughs> that is a, a good standard to set. And I'm sure one that we will uh, undoubtedly uh, continue to meet. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you. I, I, I will do my part. Uh, <laughs> and so ensuring that a modern, effective 911 system stands ready to assist Americans during a crisis is one of the Commission's most important responsibilities. And so both Congress and the Commission uh, have long recognized that 911 fees should serve 911 purposes and have worked to combat fee diversion. Recent legislation, as mentioned, adopted as part of the 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act extends, strengthens those efforts by directing the Commission to define and de deter 911 fee diversion. And so uh, I will also approve, uh, I thank the staff uh, for their hard work in quickly preparing this notice of proposed uh, rulemaking in response to the statute. Uh, of course, look forward to reviewing a robust record on these important issues. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I view this as a highly appropriate action, and I am happy uh, to uh, have the opportunity to join with Congress. And of course, um, in light of those remarks, I vote to approve. Um, thanks very much uh, to everyone who's worked hard on this uh, on this vital uh, reform item. Well, thank you. The first duty of the public servant is the public safety. So I actually believe it's fitting that the first vote at my first meeting as acting chairwoman is this rulemaking to protect and strengthen our nation's emergency number, 911. As the old saying goes, you may only call 911 once in your life, but it will be the most important call you ever make. And chances are when you make that call, you won't put much thought into the system that's behind it. 
But the reality is that with the advent of the digital age, there are technologies that could improve this system and enhance emergency calling. However, we are unlikely to see those upgrades in all parts of the United States without first halting a practice known as 911 fee diversion. That simply means that when states allow a charge on communications bills for 911 service, they shouldn't be turning around and sending those fees elsewhere, shortchanging public safety in the process. Unfortunately, fee diversion is not new. I first wrote about this subject more than four years ago. I later testified before Congress about it, and then I shared the pen with my former colleague, Michael O'Reilly, who as Commissioner Carr acknowledged was very concerned about this practice and worked hard to try to end it. Then late last year, Congress enacted new appropriations legislation providing the FCC with fresh tools to help solve this persistent problem. So we're wasting no time. Today, the FCC starts a rulemaking to ensure that fees that say they are for 911 go to 911. Specifically, we seek comment on rules that would define the kind of expenditures by states that would constitute 911 fee diversion, create a process for states to petition the FCC for case-by-case -case review, and require federal 911 grantees to provide information on fee diversion to the FCC. But that's not all. We know the results of 911 fee diversion can be tragic. It can lead to understaffed calling centers, longer wait times for an emergency, and sluggish dispatch for public safety personnel. And it can slow the ability of 911 call centers to update their systems to support digital age technologies. So consistent with this new law, I've also directed the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau to establish an interagency 911 fee diversion strike force that will study and report on what can be done to end this practice. In fact, today, the Bureau will announce it is seeking members for this group from the public safety community, as well as state and local governments. <coughs> I look forward to the work they'll do and the record that will develop in response to this rulemaking. All good ideas are welcome. We need them. In fact, I believe they can make a meaningful difference as we navigate both the ongoing pandemic and the transition to next generation 911. They are especially important for states wrestling with funding challenges, and they matter deeply for the nation's 911 operators who run emergency call centers across the country. They deserve the support intended for them. Fee diversion needs to stop. I extend my thanks to the commission staff who helped prepare this notice of proposed rulemaking, including Brenda Boykin, Jill Coogan, John Evanoff, Lisa Folks, David Firth, Erica Olson, Rachel Ware, Michael Wilhelm from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, David Horowitz, Keith McRickard, Bill Richardson, Anjali Singh from the Office of General Counsel, Chuck Needy from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Becky Tangren from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Heather Hendrickson from the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Channa Wilkerson from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, the fifth and final item today entitled Implementing the Secure and Trusted Communication Networks Act will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Welcome back, Ms. Monteith. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and good morning again to you and to commissioners, to the commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a third further notice of proposed rulemaking as part of the Commission's ongoing work to secure our nation's communications network and supply chain. The third further notice, if adopted, would seek comment on several proposals to modify the Commission's rules to incorporate changes recently enacted by Congress in the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021. I would like to thank the entire Bureau team for their hard work on, the, on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Office of Economics and Analytics and General Counsel. 
Brian Crookshank, Attorney Advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau's Competition Policy Division, will now present the item. Brian? Thanks, Chris, and good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The reliability and integrity of our communications networks has never been more important to our economic and national security. The transition to online work, school, and healthcare has elevated the risk of cyber threats to our country. Moreover, the damage from recent and highly sophisticated supply chain attacks, such as the SolarWinds software breach, has further demonstrated the need for a multifaceted and strategic approach to protecting our networks from all threats. Recognizing this, the Commission has designated Huawei and ZTE as national security threats, and as directed by Congress in the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act, established the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Reimbursement Program to reimburse carriers for the cost of removing Huawei and ZTE equipment from their networks. On December 27, 2020, the Consolidated Appropriations Act became law, appropriating $1.895 billion to fund the reimbursement program and amending, in certain respects, the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. The item before you today would see comments on proposals to ensure commission rules are consistent with the Consolidated Appropriations Act. First, the notice proposes to increase the cap on eligibility for the reimbursement program from providers with up to 2 million customers to providers with up to 10 million customers. Second, the notice proposes to limit reimbursements to the removal, replacement, and disposal of equipment and services produced or provided by Huawei or ZTE pursuant to the designation orders of those companies. Third, the notice proposes to allow reimbursement program funding to be used for equipment or services purchased, rented, leased, or otherwise obtained on or before June 30th, 2020. Fourth, in the event demand exceeds the $1.895 billion appropriated, the notice proposes to conform the Commission's existing prioritization scheme to the one adopted by Congress in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Specifically, the proposal would prioritize applicants with 2 million or fewer customers, then accredited public or private non-commercial educational institutions providing their own facilities-based educational broadband service, and lastly, any remaining eligible applicants. Finally, the notice, if adopted, would see comment on a proposal to expand the definition of provider of advanced communication service to include, for the purposes of the reimbursement program, those accredited public or private non-commercial commercial educational institutions providing their own facilities-based educational broadband and healthcare providers and libraries providing advanced communication services. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cruikshank. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. When we launched this proceeding nearly three years ago, we did so with a simple and important goal in mind, to protect America's communications networks and in turn our national security. After all, if our communications networks are threatened, everything that we've come to value is threatened. Back in April of 2018, I asked my colleagues to broaden the scope of our initial notice of proposed rulemaking to put additional options on the table. In addition to prohibiting carriers from using USF funds to purchase insecure equipment on a going forward basis, I suggested that we seek comment on removing any insecure gear that may already be in our communications networks. Last December, the FCC unanimously adopted just such a requirement, as well as a reimbursement program to support the efforts of our country's smaller carriers. But one thing was missing, funding. Congress provided that a few weeks later when it appropriated $1.9 billion for our rip and replace program. So today we take steps to incorporate the new provisions passed by Congress which will help expedite the removal of insecure equipment. I look forward to reviewing the record and moving swiftly to an order, but our work to secure U.S. communications networks certainly goes far beyond this supply chain proceeding. And that's because the threats posed by communist China do not end with Huawei or 
ZTE, or any equipment supplier. There are multiple telecom providers operating in the U.S. today that are owned or controlled by the People's Republic of China. And their operations within our borders provide opportunity for PRC-backed state actors to engage in malicious cyber activity, thus enabling economic espionage, as well as the disruption and misrouting of U.S. communications. And that's why I called on the FCC last April to commence a top-to-bottom review of every telecom carrier with ties to the communist government. As a result, we immediately issued show cause orders to four companies that are owned or controlled by the Chinese government, China Telecom, China Unicom, Pacific Networks, and Comnet. Doing so demonstrated the strength and resolve necessary to confront the modern day threats that communist China poses to our communications networks. Any backsliding or softening of our approach to China would be a monumental mistake, leaving Americans less safe and our networks less secure. Now is not the time for a return to the weak and timid approach to China that marked uh, our approaches of the past. So as we move forward with this supply chain proceeding, we should also move with dispatch to reach final decisions in these pending matters. I look forward to working with my colleagues to bring those proceedings to a close without delay. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Over the last two years, <clears throat> the Commission has made significant progress in our efforts to replace the untrustworthy Huawei and ZTE equipment in American communications networks. When I convened the Find It, Fix It, Fund It workshop in June of 2019, we still had an enormous challenge in front of us. That was identifying untrustworthy equipment in our networks, setting out a plan to fix it, and then providing funding for the replacement process. And today, with bipartisan support, both in Congress and here today, widespread participation from across the telecom industry, we have gathered information about the scope of that security problem, developed that plan to require replacement of that untrustworthy equipment, and now to provide reimbursements. The 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act marks an important milestone in our ongoing efforts. In response to the Commission's 2020 data collection on Huawei and ZTE equipment and services in the U.S. networks, Filers reported that it would cost an estimated $1.83 billion to remove and replace all that covered equipment, significantly more than the $1 billion envisioned by the 2019 Secure and Trusted Communications Network Act. And so I'm pleased that Congress provided funding that will cover those additional estimated costs. And I'm especially thankful, of course, for the leadership of Senator Gary Peters, who led the charge to expand access to federal replacement funding and was pleased to support his Ensuring Network Security Act last summer, and glad to see those were ideas were adopted into law. And so today's NPRM begins the process of updating our rules in response to these legislative changes. I thank uh, the acting chairwoman for prioritizing this necessary step towards beginning the reimbursement process, and WCB, of course, for their hard work in expediting this item for our consideration. Insecure networks, by definition, cannot provide the stable, reliable, always-on communications that Americans deserve. And so if we want Americans to have the benefits of broadband, we must continue to keep focus on cybersecurity. And so I do continue to look forward uh, with these efforts with my colleagues in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Starks. Now, Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, uh, Add my um, add my applause to um, that of, the, of my fellow commissioners in recognizing the importance of this uh, of this work and of um, and of thanking the staff uh, the the, uh, the 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 commission leadership and of uh, thanking members of Congress for their support in this as well. Um, as Commissioner Carr noted, uh, protecting America's communications networks are. Is, a, a crucial step in protecting everything that we've come to value. And in that context, I'd like to note 
that sophisticated malware attacks on local, state, and federal governments, as well as uh, as well as attacks on private companies, <laughs> are, now, um, are now constant and growing uh, growing more threatening and more sophisticated uh, all the time. As such, we must take into account when costing infrastructure, including infrastructure with a significant software component. Um, of uh, making appropriate reserves, as we're seeing here, for potential security impingements. Um, I, I look, uh, I look to a, a, a potential solution for progress on onshoring and reshoring manufacturers to prevent manufacturing contamination. And I note that the Commission's ongoing efforts to ensure um, access to test beds and uh, and improved access to uh, to security testing cycles has been um, has been beneficial towards this end, and I'm I'm sure will continue to be so. Um, I also note, um, without getting too far from the FCC's core competencies, <laughs> that, uh, that we have an ongoing need to promote robust security and uh, security cooperation with our allies abroad as well, to ensure that we um, that we don't become secure at home, only to be uh, continually insecure abroad. Um, I, I certainly certainly agree with Commissioner Starch that this um, that this represents a milestone in a complex ongoing national security effort. Um, and I applaud the, the seriousness of this, um, uh, of this new focus in ensuring that there's a society-wide new recognition of dangers that uh, can face us if our leading position in telecom is threatened. Thanks very much and uh, approve. Thank you, commissioners. There's no task at this agency or really any part of the federal government that is more important than keeping the American people safe. But history demonstrates that no single entity can meet this challenge alone. That is why I am committed to working with our federal partners and the private sector to increase the security and resiliency of our nation's communications networks. Moreover, I am guided by the conviction that working with our allies and multilateral institutions can multiply our strength across the globe. I believe it's time for this agency to revitalize its approach to network security because it is an essential part of our national security, our economic recovery, and our leadership in a post-pandemic world. So let's get started right here, right now. In appropriations legislation late last year, Congress provided $1.9 billion for the FCC to implement the requirements of the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. This law, of course, bolstered this agency's multi-year efforts to secure the communication supply chain by providing us with the authority to help remove and replace insecure network equipment across the country from the Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE, and then reimburse carriers for the cost of doing so. This is critical. That's because we know there are vulnerabilities that come with this equipment, and those vulnerabilities could provide foreign interests with access to our networks jeopardizing the security of communications in the United States. And that brings me to today's rulemaking. It's an effort to harmonize the past work of the agency on this topic with the new requirements in the appropriations legislation. That means raising the eligibility cap for those participating. It means modifying rules about how reimbursement funds can be used. And it means updating prioritization policies in the event that reimbursement costs exceed funding available. But above all, it means getting going. The sooner we conclude this proceeding, the swifter we can start helping providers secure their networks. But this is only the beginning. The damage from recent supply chain attacks, like the SolarWinds software breach, demonstrates the need for a coordinated, multifaceted, and strategic approach to protecting our networks from all threats. With this new appropriation from Congress, we have an opportunity to do just that. But we also have an opportunity right now to refresh our networks and reinvigorate our approach to network security so that the United States leads in the future of innovation. So we need to meet this moment with more than just a plan to address yesterday's security challenges, but with ideas for tomorrow's as well. That is why I have already reached out to my peers in other parts of the federal government to help coordinate and advance our implementation of the law. That includes speaking with present leadership at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber 
and emerging technology in the new administration. Now, while we make it a priority to coordinate externally, we're going to also have to do the same thing internally, as my colleague Commissioner Starks has pointed out in the past. So my office is exploring changes to the FCC process for reviewing matters related to national security, which right now are siloed within the agency's various bureaus and offices. We are going to keep pace with the growing threats to our communications. We need a dedicated interagency and cross-bureau team of experts advancing a comprehensive approach to securing our nation's communications. That work is already underway, and I look forward to the improved decision-making that will result. Now, for their diligent work to protect our network security and national security, I want to thank Pam Arluck, Brian Cruikshank, Elizabeth Kuttner, Justin Fall, Billy Layton, Chris Monteith, and Ryan Palmer of the Wireline Competition Bureau, Patrick Brogan, Alex Espinoza, Tanner Hinkle, Ken Lynch, Julia McHenry, Chuck Needy, Eric Ralph, and Emily Taliga of the Office of Economics and Analytics, and Marlena Barzilai, Michael Carlson, Rick Mallon, Linda Oliver, and Bill Richardson of the Office of General Counsel. We will now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Now, would any of my colleagues like to make any announcements at this time? I do. Commissioner, yes, go ahead, Commissioner Starks. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, and so a new year, a new semester, that of course means uh, uh, some new interns in my office. And so uh, proud to announce uh, first and foremost, Arte Abwa Barnes is a 3L joining us from Southern University Law Center. And Arte is our first early career staff diversity <laughs> initiative intern. Uh, I am deeply proud to announce that. It's a program, obviously, uh, that former Chairman Pai and I announced last fall with the goal of creating a more inclusive and diverse commission. So welcome, Arte. I also have with, this, with me this semester, Lexi Cafasso. Uh, who previously served as an intern in Public Safety Bureau. Uh, she joins us from Catholic Law School. I also have with me Katie Mellinger, who is, she is a 3L at Wake Forest University and previously uh, interned in IB. And then lastly, joining us from the West Coast is Jeff Boxer, who's a 2L at UCLA. And so in addition to the telecom work, obviously, of the office, he's been doing some subtraction on how to figure out what time he's supposed to coordinate with folks uh, across the country. Here. So thank you all for your hard work and continued um, efforts in my office. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, anyone else with an announcement? Well, if not, I have a, one of my own. So before we adjourn, let me get going. First of all, I wanna thank all of the individuals from the agency who are helping me get the office up and running. They are, um, all well known in the FCC's halls and they're all terrific. But we do have one new individual who's joining us and I wanna welcome her to the FCC family. Yesterday we announced the appointment of Paloma Perez who will be serving as FCC press secretary. She's joining the agency from the office of former Congresswoman Zochel Torres Small from New Mexico, who she served as communications director before that, she served as Deputy Communications Director and Legislative Aide to Congressman Mark Vesey of Texas. She also worked at public relations firm Burnus and Kivett. Now, she's a graduate of Swarthmore College, and she attended American University's Women and Politics Institute. She's also a native of Dripping Springs, Texas, and a first-generation college graduate. And we are thrilled to have Paloma on board, and we look forward to the community around the FCC, getting to know her and the good work she does. So if my colleagues don't have any further announcements, Madam Secretary, please announce the date of the next FCC. Sorry, I, I, oh, I'm, you're breaking in sorry, late, I, Commissioner Carr. I'm late, right ahead. late breaking news. Uh, apologies uh, for that and congratulations uh, on the announcement of the, the press secretary. Uh, in my office, uh, at least one announcement, uh, my wireline advisor, advisor uh, Joe Kalashon, uh, has uh, moved on to uh, bigger and better uh, fields. He's on detail now uh, over on the Senate Commerce Committee. So 
uh, while he once worked for me, I think I now work for him uh, and all of the staff over there on Senate Commerce. So great uh, to have Joe over there. Congratulations to him. He is a uh, wonderful, wonderful talent. Um, at the same time, I'm welcoming a new advisor uh, into the fold, uh, Greg Watson. Uh, as a policy advisor, he brings a breadth of legislative and executive branch experience to the job, working both in the White House uh, OSTP, as we all know it, as well as in Congress for the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, and so really look forward to drawing on Greg's uh, strategic advice, his deep understanding of communications policy. Um, he's obviously had a, a really sort of uh, stellar career already, uh, young but stellar career already, uh, again, in the House uh, as well as in the White House. So really glad to have him on board. Uh, so welcome to Greg. Thank you uh, to Joe. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, thank you, Commissioner Carter. Commissioner Simington, one last chance. Any any news to make uh, regarding personnel? Uh, yes, although the, the news is a bit old at this point, I'm happy to announce uh, my permanent advisor staff is, um, is Carolyn Roddy, late of NTIA, is um, chief of staff and wireline advisor. Um, Aaron Boone, well known in the halls of the FCC, as we've said today, is um, as wireless advisor. And Adam Cassidy, uh, new to Washington, D.C., as my uh, tech and media advisor. Um, thanks very much. I'm very delighted to have all of them and the chance to acknowledge them uh, on the air. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Symington. So one more time, if my colleagues do not have any further announcements, Madam Secretary, please announce the date of the next FCC agenda meeting. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. Until then, we stand adjourned. Be well, everyone.